Do you think that there was a marker that you can draw in history where suddenly a lot of women entered the staff room, or was it much more a gradual process? It was a gradual process, and I can remember quite distinctly we were addressed as a common room by a very charismatic headmistress of St Paul's called Heather Brigstock. And I can see her, picture her now sitting in the common room and saying, uh, you will never get this girl thing to work until you have some women teachers, full-time women teachers, and what's more, women teachers who are in positions of authority. Now that took a long time for a, a, a woman to become a head of department. I think there were a couple of women uh, heads of departments in after about 10 years after I'd been there. Uh, and certainly, in my memory, all this time, there have only been two uh, women house masters. Uh, we're now on our third with Dr. Ward Smith, but before that there was Dr. Ramsey, and then there was uh, a female maths teacher called Fiona Freckleton, who was very briefly uh, in charge of Rems. And I think I'm right in saying those are the only uh, three women who've got to that stage. So judging from the fact that you were taking advice from a headmistress of St Paul's, mm. can we gather that the introduction of girls to the school, which happened in part during your time, was something that had been mooted about long before? Yes. Or was a troublesome process? No, I don't think it was a troublesome process because I think there were lots and lots of girls who wanted to come to Westminster. I think the uh, selection process was incredibly random to begin with and basically uh, they were usually uh, girls who wanted to do science because the science teaching in those days wasn't very good in their own schools uh, or they were sisters of boys who were already in the school and so it was a very informal process and I think that they were simply interviewed by the headmaster and given a an English test if they were doing art subjects and a maths and that was basically it and of course in those days there were no boredoms they were all day girls but I can remember fairly early on in my time there were I think two girl monitors um, as far as I remember and then gradually the thing uh, began to grow as the school's academic record grew and also the other significant thing was this whole business of um, seventh term which was an Oxbridge term so when that uh, was abolished it meant that it was much smoother for girls to come into the school and do two years at A level before that there were two points of entry so it did mean that you, you could arrive here as a 13-year-old and start in, shall we say, September. But uh, you could arrive in the following January and be in a form called transitus. And th those people replaced the people who left at Christmas. Because in those days, you, everyone did post-Oxbridge entry. So they did their A-levels, took their A-levels, and then did the Oxford entrance. And I think that was quite difficult for girls to fit into that pattern. But it did mean that there were boys of 16 doing their A-levels. So you could have in the same class a girl who was 18 months older than the boys. And so you had these very bright, lots of them were scholars, who were doing their A-levels at 16, but in terms of maturity were not really uh, uh, up to the mark, in my opinion. So as soon as that was abolished and, and everyone went through the school at the same rate, it became easier to integrate the girls into that more streamlined academic system. And so when the girls first came to the school, they came as not as one block of 60 suddenly being exactly. formed, but yeah. rather as one or two then became a formalised group yeah. of 10, yeah. and then that gradually increased. Yeah, and I think the other factor was at that stage the headmaster was John Ray, and he had six children, four of whom were girls, and they all 
gradually came to the school, and I think that was another impetus. Um, you know, he wanted his daughters to be educated at the school.